Hi, my name is Bob Perciuseppe. I'm the president of the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, or C2ES. And I'd like to welcome all, welcome all of you here today to this event, which we're calling State of the Art Innovations in Carbon Capture and Use. Um, we've had so much interest in this session and these work and the panel discussions and the comments from the senators this morning that we're actually live streaming today. And somebody, and I should have written it down, somebody told me to do this, but I didn't. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a Twitter hashtag for this event that all of you can be tweeting away while I'm talking. Um, C2ES is a nonpartisan think tank, and we work on pragmatic solutions, and we work with, with everyone, whether, whatever the political uh, point of view is. Uh, our objective is to look for solutions that can work and that can work for a broad group of people. One of those solutions is what we're talking about today, carbon capture, use and storage. And it's being deployed now in, in dozens of locations around the world. And in the United States, we have activity in Illinois, Kansas, Michigan, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Texas, Wyoming. It's, and there's much cutting edge research being done about the technology, about the use of carbon. And we'll be hearing more about that today. So this technology exists. And more is being developed. And more innovation is occurring. But what we really need is to get more of it deployed. And that's something that everyone can agree on. And we have a work, uh, a, a work group, uh, a, 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 an initiative that uh, we have a great partner. We're actually a partner of theirs, the Great Plains Institute. And Brad Crabtree, who I want to at least raise your hand over there, Brad, uh, is here today as well from the Great Plains Institute. Between Great Plains and C2ES, we've been working on a, or, on a activity called the National Enhanced Oil Recovery Initiative, which brings together stakeholders from across the spectrum, from industry, from labor, environmental groups, all working at looking at how this can be part of the solution. And we also have an amazing amount of support in the United States Congress. Uh, lawmakers on both sides of the aisle see multiple benefits from carbon capture and use to reduce emissions, to, produce, to boost energy production, and to promote economic growth. And that's why we're so excited to see such, this, such strong bipartisan support for carbon captures. captures. Senators like Heidi Heitkamp from North Dakota, uh, Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island, uh, Shelley Capito from, whack the microphone there, uh, from West Virginia, and, and Senator Brasso from Wyoming who's just joined us. Uh, thank you all for coming today. And uh, we really appreciate the effort that you all have been making. Some of you may have been with us this summer when the four senators uh, introduced the Future Act in the Senate. Uh, we know uh, today that the companion bill has now been introduced or being introduced today in the, in the House of Representatives, another bipartisan effort in the House of Representatives. So this is, uh, we, we feel there's momentum underway here and we're very excited about today. And so I'm gonna turn it over now to Senator Heitkamp to uh, make some remarks. I'm going to try and keep my re remarks uh, uh, short. Um, I am beyond excited about what's been happening in this space. When, uh, just to give you a little background, I served as a member of an outside board, uh, outside board of directors member for Dakota Gasification. Dakota Gasification is a wholly owned um, uh, uh, C-Corp uh, uh, subsidiary of Basin Electric. It was this amazing project that was created back in the 70s when everybody thought that there wasn't enough oil and there wasn't enough natural gas and to be energy independent we needed to use that coal resource by uh, changing it into natural gas, changing it into liquids. A uh, huge, uh, as we call it, laboratory on the prairie and as things would happen when we deregulated natural gas, natural gas prices plummeted, we found out we had more natural gas, and all of a sudden the plant really was not cost effective. And so over the next 20 years, really, based on electric who bought the plant from the federal government, um, made that plant more and more uh, cost effective, uh, was able to cash flow the, the facility. One of the great stories that people don't tell enough about what Basin did is you assume that, that the CO2 capture was just part of their attempt to meet environmental regulations or anticipate perhaps some credits that they would get. That's not true. 
they started the CO2 capture project as a way to enhance the valuable byproducts that could be produced from a facility like that. And so when people told me that you could not see coal being used in a carbon neutral way and no one would ever do it, the technology didn't exist, that was a hard sell with me because I sat at that board meeting every month and listened to what we were doing every month. Now, understand that the CO2 that we captured was compressed, sent north, and enhanced oil recovery. As things progressed and as we look at what's happening more and more with oil, enhanced oil recovery, we know that we can continue to build the economic opportunities for CO2 in enhanced oil recovery. But we also know that these technologies that now are being used at SAS Power, now are being used at um, Petronova, amazing things that are happening across, across the country are proving over and over and over again that the technology exists and that the technology can be commercialized, and that we can, in fact, play a role in um, addressing carbon emissions, even though um, we're, we're people who promote and support the coal industry. And so let me tell you kind of the story of, of this, this bill. And I really do have to give a shout out to ba Brad Crabtree from my home state. Um, very early on, he spent a lot of time uh, visiting with me about how this could work if we enhanced uh, and expanded the 45Q um, credit uh, line and that we could in fact develop technologies. But, but there's two stories here. One is the growing awareness that CO2 capture sequestration and utilization can be part of the global energy picture. It can be part of the global uh, industrial picture because very many facilities in, in, uh, in Europe are using this technology behind cement plants. We're thinking about using it behind ethanol plants. So we can't just focus on the coal piece. So I think that there is now a growing awareness that the technology exists. But what's truly remarkable, and it, it, it's kind of amazing that I would say this, but what is truly remarkable is that we've been able to build a bipartisan, amazingly bipartisan and diverse group. You know, it's one thing to be bipartisan. You know, I think people would say, well, if, uh, if Susan Collins and Heidi Heitkamp are on the bill, that's not really very bipartisan. They're, they're, they're pretty ideologically connected. But think about this, last Congress, we had my friend Sheldon Whitehouse just came into the room. Um, we had Sheldon, who is well known, gives a speech every week about climate, and Mitch McConnell on the same bill. And then we had the leadership of Senator Barrasso, the chairman of the EPW committee, who was willing to come on, and Shelley, willing to not just come on to this bill, but be huge advocates. And I heard your comments, Senator Barrasso, yesterday, so grateful that you're willing to stand so firmly on behalf of this bill as the four of us continue to promote it. And so, you know, if, if nothing else, this should also serve as a beacon of hope for the ability that the United States Congress has to take the most, one of the most divisive issues of our time, which is climate and coal, and find a path forward that we can all work on together. That's truly remarkable, and we're very, very proud of the work that we're doing, very proud. Um, so let me tell you what some of the challenges for the Future Act will be. Um, we came very close a number of times to getting this enacted in law, making sure, you know, getting amendments that were considered. Um, uh, our hopes kind of have gone like this, right? Uh, we're up, we're down. I think right now the biggest challenge we have is making sure that 45Q does not get left behind in the discussions on tax reform. And so I've spent a lot of time, as, as you probably have read in the paper, um, talking to the administration about tax reform. I don't ever talk about tax reform with the administration without talking about legacy wind and, and solar tax credits, but the need to include 45Q as a legacy credit for um, the development of this technology. And so we're gonna continue to push. When you, I think um, yesterday, the, the good outcome from the hearing yesterday that Senator Barrasso held was that we're getting a number of inquiries from other members who are really intrigued and excited. And so we're gonna to continue to build our political support. Oh, we are looking at, in the lifetime of a little girl born at Women and Infants Hospital today, dramatic changes. Block Island, which many of you have heard of, one of the Nature Conservancy's last great places, becomes Block Islands. They break apart as the sea rises. Jamestown, where my senior senator lives, becomes three, not one, islands. 
Warwick Neck, a uh, big residential section of one of our uh, most important cities, becomes an island itself. The towns of Warren and Bristol, two historic towns, break off from shore and become islands. In Tiverton, there's a new island that emerges from what's now called Fogland Point, and we're gonna need to do some very, very significant uh, building to have a seawall that protects Providence. Now, Providence is in kind of a declivity like this, so you can actually build a wall across the opening fairly easily and defend it. Up in Boston, they're talking to the Dutch about how the hell you defend Boston. Because Boston Harbor, you have to build multiple walls between multiple islands around the harbor and then build a lock someplace so that the offshore traffic can come in and then drop down to the historic sea level and then continue to come into Boston without flooding the old city. So we are looking at truly destructive changes to the very shape and nature of our state. And so I feel considerable urgency about getting something done. And one of those tranches is carbon capture utilization and storage. Pumping it underground, using it for enhanced oil recovery, having it bond with certain geological strata to actually harden up when it hits them and stay, uh, solidify, uh, stripping it out of uh, the air, stripping it out of the water, uh, we have a, uh, a significant aquaculture economy. You can't grow an oyster in acidic water that eats away the shell of the little villager oyster more rapidly than it can grow it. So that whole industry just disappears. We've seen that already happen on the West Coast, preview of coming attractions for us. So the acidification of the oceans, which is an undeniable chemical fact, I actually did a little experiment on the Senate floor and blew through an aquarium bubble into a glass of the water that the pages give us and with pH dye showed the before and after of the dramatic pH change just one breath blown through the water does. So we know that the absorption of 30% of the excess carbon dioxide emissions by the ocean changes it chemically and that's going to be pretty dramatic. So this is important. We need to work together on it. I hope that there are other areas that we can work together as well. The point that I'll make in closing in terms of, I think we're in pretty good shape on this. We need to round up a bunch more Republican co-sponsors so it doesn't get too out of balance. I think we're like 25 and nine right now, and that's about the limit. If it gets to 48 and nine, people start to panic about, oh no, this isn't a fair balanced bill. So, but I think if, if we can get to a significant group of people who will co-sponsor it, or tell the leader that they will vote for it, then we're in pretty good place to get this passed. So I'm feeling reasonably comfortable about this, and I think the next thing we need to really start thinking about is a price on carbon, because all of the witnesses yesterday agreed that the thing that's stopping this from going is that there's no revenue stream. There's no reward for doing it, and if there's not a price on carbon, there's never going to be revenues for this. If nobody will pay you for eliminating carbon emissions, then you're not going to get a lot of investment in reducing carbon emissions, whether you're making algae or doing enhanced oil recovery or pumping it into the ground or extracting it from the air or whatever you're doing. So that takes us to this next point, which is this question of what the social cost of carbon is and how we should bake it into a real market. I think that every single economist in the country believes that there needs to be a price on carbon because that's just basic market theory. You shouldn't have negative externalities in a market environment. That's kind of market 101. So how do we get there? One thing that is, I think, going to help to push us is that all the courts that have looked at this, every single one, three United States Circuit Courts of Appeals, multiple district courts, and some very significant administrative agencies from state PUCs to federal administrative agencies have said you got to have a social cost of carbon baked into your decision making or else it doesn't meet the Administrative Procedures Act standard of being not arbitrary and not capricious. And from a legal point of view, you fail the test if you don't have that baked in. That is happening over and over and it is, without exception, the finding. So that, I think, is a very good step and allows us some progress to try to bake it in. 
Shelley and John are from states that are highly economically dependent on coal. It is a very significant problem for them, and as much as I hope that they will consider the suffering and the woes of Rhode Island's ocean economy, I pledge that I understand and sympathize with the sufferings and woes of their coal economy. But what are you going to do about it? If you can put a proper price on carbon, you suddenly have a revenue stream that can, to quote Huey Long, make every miner a king. You can pave the streets of coal country with gold for not too much money. You can protect Wyoming's 64% revenue stream that comes out of carbon. You can make sure that when Shelley goes to the hollers of West Virginia, people are grateful to see her. She has delivered something that has made their lives better and that her name and President Trump's name will be uttered by their grandchildren for having helped uh, Grandpa out of the predicament that the market had put this fuel into. So there's lots of opportunity here, and I'm excited that this is a piece of it that is moving forward, and I encourage you to keep the pressure on, because when the day comes that it is clear that we have missed this boat, and that it was the type of politics that it's been that has caused us to miss this boat, it can be very hard to show that America is the city on a hill, Ronald Reagan said it was, when we've blown it this badly, this publicly. Let's not go there. Let's get this done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Capito. Well, thank you, Bob, and uh, Sheldon, and um, Heidi, and uh, Chairman Barrasso, it's nice to be here. It's nice to be here with all of you. Uh, I was looking at your panel, uh, and we had a great hearing in uh, EPW committee yesterday with several of your panelists. Uh, they were, there he is, Leo, he was, they were great. And uh, I learned a lot uh, about so, uh, something that I thought I already knew a lot about. But what I learned by listening to Sheldon is when he, he talked about my name in West Virginia with President Trump's name, did you all hear him say that he wanted to build a wall? Um, I think that's what we need to tell President Trump, that you were wanting to build a wall, Sheldon. I don't have to tell him where and how and who's going to pay for it, but uh, that's a great clip from you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I thought I'd add a little levity to the, to the morning uh, on a very serious subject. Um, Senator Heidkamp has been such a great leader on this issue, um, and I've learned a lot from her, but I've learned also that her compassion around this issue, and that she devoted an entire radio show to this, and she invited Sheldon and I to come on and be her guests. So I'm sure with the multi-millions of people that listen to the radio interview, Heidi, that we're going to have all kinds of... Uh, uh, support here. But I think we will have all kinds of support here, just sort of on, on a more um, uh, more topical or a larger topic kind of way, the way I see it, coming from a coal producing state. And this came up in the hearing yesterday uh, slightly. But um, number one, the energy independence of what we're looking at here. We have a great opportunity in this country to not just capitalize on our energy, but become energy independent, which translates into an energy economy and growing jobs and preserving jobs and stabilizing jobs. One of the questions from uh, the senator from California yesterday to Dr. Friedman was how, are, how does uh, employing the technology of CCUS what does this do in terms of jobs and job creation? He did a good job of talking about all of the, not just new jobs and, and, and um, jobs of the future that are connected with this, but also with the sustainability of some of the jobs that we have now and how this will sustain them for the future and in a lot of different ways. And I added in, this helps coal miners in every, in every single way, because in order to keep, keep mining coal, we do have to move in this direction. We know this, and that's why some of the, uh, um, some of the research that's gone on is uh, in, in our neck of the woods at the National Energy Technology Lab. We're doing a lot of in uh, research there, also at West Virginia University, because it is an, e it is our economic, uh, uh, an, e an economic benefit to us. It's jobs, it's wages, it's raising your family, it's living in a state that you love. Um, 
I think also as we're developing this technology and hopefully this bill that we talked about, the Future Act, will, will lead us to this, it's important for us to realize also what an economic driver being able to deploy the technology around the world is. If we become and when we become the leader here as we, as we are moving in that direction, we can then uh, uh, deploy the technology around areas that uh, don't have electricity now, that have maybe availability of, uh, of a less expensive uh, energy source such, such as coal, but also um, uh, keep, uh, keep the environmental considerations front and center. So I'm excited about the economic benefits of deploying the technology that I think this future act will drive. We have a great bipartisan, um, I was just at a meeting earlier this morning and they're like, can you get some kind of bipartisanship going here? I said, unfortunately, we do have a lot of bipartisanship that goes in a lot of different ways. It's just the big issues we, that get covered in the media sometimes look like we're not talking, we're not working together, we're not seeking solutions. And I hope one of the takeaways that you take away from today is that we are working together to try to figure out a way to get uh, Sheldon Whitehouse and Shelley Moore Capito on a same on a same bill when we have divergent bill views many times in the EPW committee, we are working towards this, and I look forward to um, getting more co-sponsors uh, and and uh, with your all's help, making sure that um, the economic benefits from moving forward to this and the energy independence and security that will come along with it are something that we can all take advantage of. So thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, S Senator Brasso, I think it's your turn. Uh, I also want to add the thanks for the hearing you guys had yesterday. Um, it's outstanding, and we really appreciate it. Come on up. Well, Bob, first I wanted to thank you for your leadership uh, through the years, and I appreciate everyone being here. It's great to be here with Sheldon and, and Shelley. And I will tell you, in terms of Heidi, we actually met for the first time. You weren't a senator yet, it, but it was in Gillette, Wyoming, at the opening of the Dry Fork uh, power plant, which was the, the last uh, coal-fired power plant to open in the United States. And you were there because of your role as, on the, in the leadership of Basin Electric. So that's where our connection and friendship began, was at a coal-fired power plant in Gillette, Wyoming. And from the hearing yesterday, the uh, Matt Fry, who testified, is in charge of the, this program, the Integrated Test Center, that deals with the coal issues in Gillette and trying to find better ways to, to scale, deal with the things that we're trying to deal with here, with carbon capture, utilization, uh, sequestration. And I thought we had a terrific panel. You know, so often you have, you know, the Republican, the Democrat, we had three excellent people testifying, and uh, Dave Greeson is here, he's on well, your first panel, and uh, Julio Friedman is here, and he's on one of the panels this morning. You can tell what party people, we were all working together for the benefit of America to make sure that we can give people affordable energy, reliable energy. The thing I like about he Heidi, and we talk a lot about energy, I think one time you said, you know, we were talking about oil. You said, you don't want to give the keys to the car to the guy that wants to keep all the oil in the ground, because there's a gap between the reliable energy that we need to power the country and the, re the renewable and the renewable energy, which is good, important, has to be part of the mix, but isn't enough at this point to power the country and deal with the needs. So I always think about the, the three E's when I think about energy, which is energy security, economic strength, and environmental stewardship. And I think this, what we're doing here with the Future Act, uh, is, is aimed at all of those components. Uh, and Shelley and I visit regularly, we both we can often sit next to each other at the EPW committee working on these very issues, looking for ways to do things um, in a bipartisan way. And as you said, it is good to see the bipartisanship, which means it probably will not be reported in the press because it, when people are getting and working along, working together, uh, but I think many people don't realize uh, how often we do work together. I mean, Sheldon and I went with uh, John McCain basically to look at climate changes, uh, and we went to Nor Norway, and we've both been to Svalbard, and you're really up there in the northern, northern parts of the planet. But one thing is when you're traveling with John McCain, Sheldon and I continued to get the same question no matter we, wherever we went. People would come up, so you're with Senator McCain, and say, yes. Then they'd hand you their cell phone and say, will you please take a picture of me with Senator McCain? <laughs> <laughs> Bipartisan. <laughs> 
But I just wanted to be here to uh, express my appreciation for what you're all doing to work on this legislation in a bipartisan way. Uh, we all want to make energy as clean as we can, as fast as we can, do it in a responsible way. And I think that we're doing that uh, here today and why we're working so hard together in a bipartisan way as part of this legislation. I'm delighted with the panel that you put together. And again, Bob, thanks so much for your leadership. Thanks for having me.